Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kim Barra Show. I am your host, Kim Barra, and on today's episode, we are joined by Mr. Chris Bello. Now, Chris is probably the poster child for being intentional. Uh, he's a property uh, connector over in the United States. He does a phenomenal job in this property space, has a huge podcast, and you can just tell that he's very intentional about everything that he does. And we kind of break down and strip that back inside this episode. And if we can help you be intentional with your marketing, just head over to marketingmogul.com.au where we have you covered. But until then, let's jump into the show. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you making the time. Thank you so much for having me, Kim. I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's great to have you. Now, I always like to start the podcast off the same way every time, which is if you and I met at a party and we're chatting away and I said to you, what is it that you actually do? What's your go-to answer? My go-to answer, I kind of just keep it short and sweet. I tell people I'm a real estate expert and top podcast host. So I really love just transforming people's lives, whether that's helping them get into or out of a property or a real estate investment, as well as just provide tips. I find myself giving a lot of you know free advice on podcasts and things like that. I love productivity. We talked about it on, when you were on my show. You love what you do. And even if you had to do it for free, you actually did do it for free for a few clients when the pandemic started and you loved it. Uh, same thing here. I mean, I just love connecting with people and making the world a better place one person at a time, uh, if that makes sense. So I know I just I just butchered the question and said it's super long, but that's probably how I would say it at a real party. I like to talk a lot. <laughs> no, I love that. And then so from there, because real estate and property, um, a lot of people, they go, oh, yeah, this guy's in real estate. And some people go, oh, okay, cool. But for me, I always go, there's so much in the real estate and property sphere. Like I have a, um, a friend and business partner here in Australia and he's in uh, in property development. And it's just like, there's such a myriad of different things. What's your favorite oh, yeah. or like, what, what area do you like to really focus on in, uh, in property? And obviously being in the U S um, you know, probably many things I don't know about the property over there, but like, what, what's your, what's your go-to area that you love? There's tons of areas for sure. And it's important to just niche down even within something like real estate. You can't just be like, hey, I do real estate. Within real estate, there's wholesaling and flipping and being a real estate agent. Um, I kind of view myself as more of a connector. And so I've done wholesaling, which is just finding off-market properties, finding a buyer, and then you can close on the transaction. But I also have my license, my real estate license. But ultimately, I invite people to reach out to me for any of their questions and I like to connect them. I mean, even outside of real estate, I was helping someone find a job earlier who's just graduating from university and they want to get into supply chain, which is what I studied back in university. Um, so really being a connector, it's like, hey, someone's got a problem. They need a solution. Being that person who, who connects the dots, you can get a reward, either a commission, an assignment fee. Uh, and there's a lot of value that's created there because both people have a need, right? So just the short and sweet of it, I like to call myself a connector, but I have dealt with investment properties, residential side, as well as helping clients buy their dream home that doesn't need any TLC. Nice. And so what, like, is there a category, like, because in Australia, there's a big movement at the moment, and I believe that they're categorized as buyer's agents um, and things like that. Is there like a, I know you're the connector, but is there like, is, is that a similar sort of category in the US as well? Yeah, they do refer to either a buyer's agent, you're helping the buyer or listing agent is the person who has the listing, you know, is representing the seller. The the thing that I always hear, I always go for leverage. I always look at Pareto principle and I'm big on productivity, like I mentioned. So most of the time on my podcast, I don't even really talk about real estate. It's more mindset, efficiency, delegating. But from the real estate side, you do get leverage from getting listings because I can have my sign in the yard and other people are bringing their buyers, their clients, they're driving for eight hours on Saturday while I'm chilling, you know, going on a hike in the mountains and then getting the listing sold for my client um, and just seeing all the offers come in via email. So th I love working with both, but I am big on leveraging my time and being a buyer's agent. Oftentimes you're out there showing houses and making offers and losing in this crazy market. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it on your side too, like 10 offers on a property in two days. It's just insane. Uh, so it is tough being a buyer's agent right now. So focusing on 
how do I move the needle more by doing less? That's focusing on listings for me right now. So I've been more of a listing agent. Hmm. And so what, what avenues, as you mentioned there, obviously you've got the sign in the yard, the, uh, the old school real estate thing, which I think is in every, every country, everywhere. It's like, it, it yeah. obviously works. What's up uh, being that I'm, you know, a marketing guy and I always am curious at advertising, what channels do you normally use as, um, on, on top of that to try and bring in those ideal clients for you, uh, whether it be connecting them for that or, or otherwise? Yeah. So social media is big. I mean, even how I get all my clients, it's been all through my network organically, either people that know me or people that are referred to me. So that's the same thing I'm doing with real estate. And it's funny because I actually had a big guest on my show uh, in the real estate space, Krista Mayshore, and she's huge on this. She'll put $250 of ad spend behind a video to market a new listing talking about all the features and getting, you know, thousands and thousands of views from local buyers in the market. Um, so <laughs> Truth be told, I was like, that's a really good idea. I don't really do that. I should do that. And I was one of the agents who I am utilizing social media and all of those things as a millennial, but there, there are opportunities where I can capitalize on getting more exposure from you know advertisements and targeted ads in a certain market. So um, I have been doing the sign in the yard, but a lot of times just listing it on the MLS itself, like the multiple listing service. That propagates through all the other sites, you know, Zillow, Redfin, Trulia. So if you're updating it there, you've got great photos, you price it correctly, you don't mess up the number of bedrooms. Like if it's a three bedroom and you're saying it's got four, uh, people are going to be upset when they see the house and they're like, where's the fourth bedroom? I see it happen all the time, right? So really doing your homework on the front end prevents a lot of headaches on the back end. And uh, I know the market's crazy and I, I am relatively young and I haven't been through, you know, the recessions and everything and housing market crash. Um, so I am kind of optimistic, but in a way, this market listings have been selling themselves um, if it is priced correctly. But of course, that can change. And you know, you may need to market a little more heavily in the future when it shifts back to being a buyer's market. Um, so trying everything you can, right? Even old school, texting a, an agent that you know, like, hey, I've got this property. I know you, you like this area. Do you have any buyers that might be interested in it, right? That's like the relationship game, which it's not scalable. You have to network, but it does work because they're like, oh my gosh, I have I have somebody. We'll get you an offer tonight. Like it, it happens every day of the week, right? Yeah, I love that. And so what actually got you into the world of property? Like, were you always just like, I love property? Or did you watch like, you know, were you like me watching Million Dollar Listing? And you're like, I'm going to be like, you know, when I saw that, I was like, should I become a, a real estate agent? Yeah, exactly. Should I try and sell like so? What, uh, yeah, what, that, what got you into the game? That's a great question. I mean, I actually, I kind of mentioned it. I studied supply chain in university. I worked in oil and gas and it was kind of unfulfilling to me. I didn't see myself being stuck behind the cubicle too long. And I liked the idea of being out and about talking to clients, seeing different properties, driving around town, just moving, right? I have a stand-up desk right now. I don't want to be sitting too much all day. Uh, and I like seeing new things. I guess novelty is something that I'm interested in. My my life coach was telling me I need more new stuff in my life. Like I get kind of bored and used to stuff easily. So when I can see some amazing thing, like the great sand dunes, I just went there recently um, in Colorado. I forget the little town that it's in. It was, it was eye-opening to me because I'm like, whoa, feels like I'm in the desert. I'm just looking for a magic carpet. I haven't seen something like this, right? So property was the same thing. When you're walking into a beautiful house and it's got this huge closet, you can imagine it being yours or like, how's my dream house going to look one day, right? The creativity uh, can kind of unleash at that point versus just sitting here and you're like in your apartment or in a house that maybe isn't your dream house. It's a starter home and it's easy to kind of feel complacent. But when you're seeing these properties, it, it helps you dream bigger, but also you get to see the dreams that you're enabling for others. So I always knew real estate was calling my name, but it took a couple of years to realize, hey, I don't want to do this corporate thing to jump ship and then say, hey, let me just try jumping into real estate, working with a couple of investors and seeing how it goes. And I mean, the what do they say? Uh, the rest is history, as the saying goes. I mean, I started in 20, 2017 is when I got started in real estate. And here we are, you know, been consistently helping clients, connecting the dots and you know, doing a couple of investments here and there as well. Yeah, and I think what you mentioned there, very key as well, is it's not always about what you want, but it's also what you don't want. By like going into corporate, you're like, cool, actually, I, I don't want this. And you, you have to go through those experiences right. sometimes. It's like you can't always hit the nail on the head and be like, 
I'm going to become the best property connector ever. And I'm just going to start there because I know that's what I want. It's like, oh, what is this? And like, okay, I don't like all these things. So let's, how do I remove that and then be exactly. able to do what I actually want to do? Exactly. So sometimes you have to try something because how do you know you're going to like it if you don't try it? You know, like some people are like, oh, I hate skydiving. I'm scared of heights. It's like, have you ever been? No. Well, how do you know you're not going to have a blast <laughs> after the first 10 seconds of fear or even traveling alone? A lot of times people shut themselves down and they're just like, I don't like doing that, or I'm not that kind of that kind of person. And they're automatically labeling themselves where now they're not going to be that kind of person because they just said that they can't, right? It's very, I'm very careful with the words that I use in, in everything that I do, real estate and productivity and working out and all of that. Yeah, hundred percent. I know like even for me, when I just, just to push myself out of my comfort zone a bit, every time I go to a new city like when we were able to travel uh free and easily i would travel a lot for speaking events and whatnot and i would always try and find especially in some of the asian countries it was pretty weird but like what's like the local delicacy what's the different thing that they have um and i would try it i know like, i'm gonna eat it like i'm gonna give it a try and see what it's like just to push myself outside that comfort zone whereas back home like when i'm here normally it's like cool i know like i, I eat like my steak my vegetables my chicken like it's very specific <laughs> so i'm like well if i'm traveling you know, I've and I've then I've eaten some some weird stuff as a byproduct of that, like snake and horse like and a whole bunch of different and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and like in, yeah. And you go to places like Thailand, and you're like, oh, kind of don't want to eat Crickets. this grasshopper, but yeah, <laughs> it's cool. yeah. I don't think I ever tried like the grasshopper on a stick when I went out to uh, Southeast Asia, but I have tried. I love finding the hole in the wall place that has really good reviews, and it's like three dollars a plate i'm like how the heck is it so cheap everything in the u.s is you know maybe the inflation everything's making everything seem even more expensive but i just remember vietnam and thailand and uh trying new things getting outside the comfort zone doing that consistently it's it's very freeing because now when you're comfortable being uncomfortable nothing really freaks you out right everything happening in the world now just knowing that nothing's certain and things can change tomorrow I mean, you know, as a marketer, right? Like an algorithm can change and now, whoa, what's going on? Our ads aren't are working as well. You've got to be able to adapt in it, in anything that you do. And so I think it kind of gives you that calm headed where you're cool, you're, co you're collected, you're not freaking out about really anything. It's like you're a robot sometimes, you know? I'm like, hey, what's the mission? These are my tasks today. I'm going to get them done no matter what's happening. I'm not watching the news or anything. I'm just going to go, I'm going to go work out. I'm going to go uh, make a content post on my social media. And then I'm going to do a podcast. And, you know, if an asteroid hits earth at noon, like I can't control that. I'm focusing on what can I actually control, uh, which I think is an important mindset for entrepreneurs and people in general. And then uh, leading off from that. So obviously when you started your business, been in there for a couple of years and during that, you've obviously been hit with the pandemic and coronavirus. And then obviously, who knows what's to come in the future. Being that, you know, some people were touting that there might be another GFC type event or there could be another whole, who knows, you know, the Delta super 25 million percent more stronger variant comes out or something like that. What, what, what did you do during COVID to kind of like adapt what you were doing? And then like what plans going forward if there is another... Uh, I forget what they call it. Not a black dog event, but there's a black swan event. I think it is another like event like that black happens. Swan, yes. Yeah. Whether it be a, um, whether it be a, you know, a GFC type situation or something else, like what are you doing differently and looking at your business differently um, going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. So funny enough, I actually relocated from Texas to Colorado in March of this year. I just, I, I came here last uh, year to visit and I realized that I was I had closings while I was on vacation. I'm like, well, my clients don't seem to care. I'm still getting great reviews. I'm not in the picture at closing, but they still left me a good review and we got the result, right? I had leveraged other people. And even in the midst of uh, COVID before, there were, before we really knew what was happening, a lot of people resorted to virtual showings like, hey, I'll Zoom you. I'll walk through the house and have all the PPC on or whatever you need to wear and show the buyers or the sellers like what's going on. And you can do everything virtually. I, I made that realization. And so that's what led me to do 100% virtual real estate where honestly, I don't even have my license in Colorado. I'm licensed in the state of Texas, but I can still connect the dots. I had a buyer buy a house in Seattle. I got wired a referral commission whenever the agent did the deal. So for 40 minutes of calls, I connected the buyer with a solid uh, real estate agent Added the value there. I think I made like $3,000 on that for like 40 minutes of calls. 
Uh, same thing. I've got someone looking in Utah. I haven't been to Utah in like 10 years. I went one time for spring break for a ski trip. But again, it goes back to connection and just adding value. So no matter what happens, people need to live somewhere. I made this realization. I used to like flip cell phones online, you know, find a crack screen phone and find a buyer. And I made the same realization, like, just like if you lost your phone today, you'd probably go get another one today. Like you kind of need a phone to do almost everything. I don't know how to get around without my GPS, right? On my phone. So same thing with living. People need to live somewhere. They need to sell when they need to sell. They've got to move. They're relocating for work. Uh, And so no matter what happens in the world, I mean, as long as there is a world, there's a book that I read, The Simple Path to Wealth. I don't know if you've ever read it. Uh, He's talking about an investing strategy. And he's like, hey, what if the aliens come and invade? He's like, hey, this advice will work for you. If the aliens come or an asteroid wipes us all out, none of this will matter anyway. (laughs) So I found that very humbling. It's like, look, I'm going to be doing just fine as long as the world as it is today stays somewhat constant. Now, if there is like an extinction event or like we're in the book of Eli, if you've ever seen that movie with like Denzel Washington, that may be a little bit different, right? If we don't have houses, my business model may change, but then again, we're all going to be fighting for survival every day anyway, right? So I'm a very positive and optimistic person though. I'm like, Hey, you know, there's a lot of good things happening. People are focusing on sustainability and figuring out how to solve the climate issues that we're having in the world. And while we have been damaging the planet and there are problems that we need to address, I am positive and optimistic that we're going to be okay. Um, But then again, like I just mentioned, I, I worry about what I can control. You know, I don't worry about all the stuff that could happen one year from now, two years from now, Delta plus, like whatever's coming out in the future, like just do the best you can have a positive attitude. And that's kind of my mantra. I mean, I'm sure you feel probably similarly. Most entrepreneurs are like gritty, let's go, no excuses, right? Show up every day type thing. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, it, like similar to when we, I think we were talking on, on your podcast and like looking back over things, it's like now you can put in place certain plans if something happens again because it's like you've gone through it right. if you haven't gone through it it's pretty hard to ascertain like people going like oh like you know um over in australia there's a lot of like tension sometimes between australia and like china and things like that and they're like oh what if, it's, if, it's, if it's a war breaks out or something like that it's like it's like i have no idea like no one can tell like none mm-hmm. of us like you can't worry about all those things too yeah exactly because if you worry about it like you bring on and most people I encourage everyone listening to try and think back when the very first time when coronavirus was announced, I bet you everyone at some point in time thought that they had it just because they were watching stuff about it. They were listening to stuff about it. They were reading stuff about it. I remember when it first came out, I noticed it in the first day and then I stopped looking at any of the stuff apart from like government announcements over like what we could actually do because I know the first day I read all the things and I was like, <clears throat> I was like, am I having trouble breathing? Like, I think I have. <laughs> yeah, I was like, is, that, is this For what real? It is? I've like, been like paranoid yeah. checking my oxygen all the time. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it went down by one, you know, on my oximeter. Am I dying? Like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> totally like, ev- everyone had this. So by, by con- being consumed and consuming, it's like you limit your ability to be able to do anything else. And as you say, if you can focus on what you can control and then outside yep. of that, it's like, great. Like I tuned everything else out. I'm like, cool. Unless it's relating to like what I can actually do as in like, leave the house, go to certain places. What I need to do is like, I really don't want to be involved in it because it's like, it doesn't give me any benefit. There's no, like, and I already have enough stuff going on in my brain. I don't need to add a whole bunch of other stuff in there. So whole, uh, whole highly agree with you there. So if you just focus on that, then it's like, it's, it's all green lights ahead in, in my opinion anyway. Um, and so, yeah. And so like, obviously you, you are traveling, you're, you're getting to explore around and uh, be a, a virtual, uh, you know, Agent Connector, which is awesome. What's um what what's coming up next for you? Like what any uh any new things on the horizon or like what's uh what's happening for you in the next you know six months, 12 months? Great question. And, and what we talked about on my podcast was super helpful. I mean, I know setting goals is important, reverse engineering, figuring out what do you really want, right? Because I I set goals for myself. I want to be a millionaire by 30, and my five-year goal was to have $10 million net worth. And then I kind of realized I've heard several podcasts and people who are successful financially and just all around that it's not just all about the money. A certain number is not going to fulfill you. You know, hitting the $10 million, you're going to see the bigger, you're going to climb that mountain and you're going to see the next one. Like, well, how do I get to 100 million? Right. It's just when does it ever end? And so 
I figured out the way I know how to have a conversation and generate an income, you know, three weeks later, I can generate five, ten thousand dollars based on helping someone with a real estate transaction. So now I'm focusing more on the longer term, you know, like the purpose, mission driven stuff. I'm really diving into that. I know I kind of mentioned um, on my show earlier as well as like, or on your show, is that we we want to do we want to help people out, whether it's free or not. Like I don't care. I have conversations with people sometimes, and there's no outcome. I'm not trying to charge them. Somebody yesterday was like, "Do you do coaching, or do you have a mastermind or a, co- a course I can purchase?" I'm like, you know, I've I've thought about it. I need to do it. I'm kind of unorganized. I haven't created it, but I'm happy to just talk here for 30 minutes with you, even though there's not really a financial benefit for me because this is what I enjoy doing, right? So um, I've had people ask that question before and really I'm going to continue to do what lights me up, which is connecting with others, maybe providing some free advice and maybe that yields a referral or a transaction four months from now, four years from now, it doesn't matter making that positive impact however I can. And so I'm sure you get the same feeling. You get a message from a a listener of your podcast and it just makes you feel so happy inside. You're just like, oh my gosh, someone quit their job because of my advice. You know, they they took it and ran with it. Um, So six months from now, that's what I'm going to continue to do is just waking up, responding to those DMs, creating podcasts like the one we're doing now. Um, and I, I just love doing this. So I don't have, I need to set like a bigger target goal. You know, I, I kind of feel a little aimless right now, but I'm like, look, life's good. Is it okay to just sit here and enjoy it? You know, like, do I have to set another goal for 5 million or 10 million? Like, I feel like I'm kind of in that enjoyment phase of being happy, being content, uh, appreciating what I've already achieved and what I have now, you know, instead of constantly oh, that guy's got a nicer house. That person has a nicer car. You know, it never ends. So I'm trying to avoid getting in that, sucked into that black hole of never ending um, wants and needs, you know? Yeah, I love that. Now that's absolutely amazing. And yeah, as you said, like that connection, that ongoing um, relationship with people. I remember when I was young, I read a book. It's called Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty by Harvey McKay. And it's all about, it's like basically, and because I think the from memory, it's like the premise of the start of the book is, it's midnight someone's got like a gun to your loved one's head and they said hey you need to get twenty thousand dollars in cash right now and it was like how many people could you call and number one would they actually take the call and number two be like no questions asked Mm -hmm. like i'm going to come and drop that off for you like it doesn't have to be might be two thousand right maybe not twenty thousand but that and that was a good like question when he asked and i was like "Mm, i wonder like when i was going through it and i was like well, because most people, when it's when they want something, it's like it's transactional. It's like, yeah, cool. You do this for me. I do this for you. Um, and then after reading that book, I was like, well, yeah. If, like, if you're thirsty right now, you don't want to be digging the well because you know it's the same as they always say. It's like if you're if you're uh, and probably especially with property and things like that. It's like when you really need to get a property and you really need finance, it's probably going to be really hard for you to get finance. But when you don't need finance, yes. when it's like the bank's like, yeah, have sixteen different credit cards, like you know, like they just throw it at you, and you don't be like, I don't need this at the moment. Like, what are you doing? Right. So like digging that well before you're thirsty, like providing that value, because then there will be, there might be a point in time where you're like, oh, you know, hey, that person in Utah, I'm coming down to Utah and I need to hook up with this, this or this. Like, I need a place what, to stay. Yeah, there like, we go. What, can you help me out? You're like, they're like, oh, of course, you know, like who knows what you're going to need. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate of that as well. So it's great to hear. Yeah. And just what goes around comes around, you know, that abundance mentality. I've been really big on that where you'll see people say, why are you doing that for free? Or why are you you making money with that podcast yet? They're so focused on the short term. Whereas many of us entrepreneurs who've been doing it for some time, we're in it for the long game, right? I'm not trying to make a million dollars in two months. Like I I don't mind. I, I think I'm 310, 311 podcast episodes deep. I don't really have ads or anything on the show. Like I'm still having fun with it, right? I enjoy the connection and I enjoy when people message me saying they got value from it. And so I know from that, a lot has resulted in like commissions and referrals and people working with me without me asking. I have like a slight call to action, but really if someone loves what you're saying, if they're really impacted by what you say, they're going to find a way to reach out and there's your Instagram. They're going to follow you. Oh, you've got like a free webinar. Let me go do that. And then and you might have that course where you're, hey, call to action. Anyone wants to join me? 10 people in Arizona. We're doing a mastermind. Uh, <laughs> kind of like your like your thing when you sent that email when you were really early on in your career. First 10 people to sign up, we're going to go hang out in uh, this mansion in Arizona that I'm renting, right? And that's the kind of stuff that I want to focus on doing is just making impact, making new, valuable, real connections. 
um, in karma, you know, what goes around comes around, like putting good out into the world will result in good coming back to you. Yeah. hundred percent, man. Love that. And now as we get towards the end of our time here together, again, I'd like to ask the uh, same question to wrap up the podcast, which is what's the question that I didn't ask you that I should have? That's a good question to ask. <laughs> I need to start asking that on my show too. <laughs> so I, I am very big on productivity. And I guess the question that a lot of people ask is maybe what's your best productivity tip or what's been the most effective for you. Um, so I'm happy to share that just yeah, if there's please. any value for your audience, because we're always trying to make things better, be more efficient, do more things in less time. And so for me, for anyone who's in sales or has bookings or anything like that, uh, there's different scheduling software, but I've been a huge fan of uh, Calendly, super simple. I think I pay like 10 bucks a month for it or something for the premium. And literally it has freed up my time in my mental space, because say someone wants to uh, book a time to chat about buying a house or they want to be on the podcast, there's separate links. I send them out and those bookings happen during my preferred time. So I'm not like, oh my gosh, someone's calling me right now. I better answer the phone call or I might miss this opportunity. No, instead, right before you and I got on this call, I saw that somebody who I texted a link to yesterday booked a call for Monday, which follows in my rules. I don't let people book me on Fridays or Sundays. And I guess they didn't want to talk on Saturday. And so for a Monday evening, we're going to be talking about buying a house um, for this for this gentleman who I spoke with a few days ago. And so that's the power of having a booking software um, in terms of automating and outsourcing that entire thing. I don't even have an assistant to do it. It's just like sends reminder emails for me, sends text messages. And while I'm sleeping at night, I wake up and I'm like, oh, cool. I have three podcasts this week that my assistant sent out the link to potential guests, right? Uh, so it works like clockwork, frees up your time. And all you got to do is show up and provide your best energy on whatever conversation you're having. So hopefully that was a, a valuable nugget for anyone who has not implemented that just yet. Big time. And, the, and the, especially the point, I think the, the even more intricate little hack is there is like, great, is blocking out your time. Because some people, they'll go and set up something like Calendly, but then they have their entire schedule access. And it's, yeah, like booking whenever you want. And it's the same as like me. It's like, apart from probably this one today, because we were trying to get time zone sorted and we both, you know, were able to um, go on each other's shows. It's like, I had very specific times when I would record my podcast or like if I do coaching calls for clients, like only on Tuesdays. They're like, why are you only available on Tuesdays? I was like, because I'd rather have one full on day. And be like, cool, like today is my day to be max energy and go hard rather than have them spread out across six different days um, and all different times. It's like, cool, you want to speak to me? It's like these times. And I think that is, uh, yeah, it's hugely like secondary little little uh, hack you put in there as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, you've got to be detailed about it and intentional. So for me, I, I wrote this out. This may be helpful, like one more little bonus tip. Write out your ideal schedule on a, you know, take take pen to paper. And I figured, you know, it'd be cool to not do any calls on Friday. It would be cool to not work on Sunday. I'm okay doing one or two calls on a Saturday, like at noon after I go to the gym. Uh, and so that's what became my schedule. And similar to you, I do all my podcasts on Tuesdays. So I think I'm all I'm booked all the way through Jan, but I also only allow two podcasts per Tuesday, right? So I'm not doing five hours in a row where I'm like, geez, I'm burnt. I don't even know how to speak anymore. You know, it's like enough to br bring my best energy, have a great time, but also not feel like it's a burden. So thank you for pointing that out too. That That's the true hack is not having 24 seven availability, being very intentional about when people can book certain event types. Love that. And then, so for anyone that's been listening and they're like, oh, I really want to know more about what Chris is up to, what he's going on. Like, you know, who knows? Maybe they're like, hey, maybe I need to connect with him and uh, check out some, some US properties. Where's the best place for people to connect to learn more about what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. So my my Instagram handle is Chris Bello underscore, just C-H-R-I-S, B as in boy, E-L-L-O underscore. That's going to be the best place to find me. Um, I also have a top rated podcast, the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast, just passed a million total downloads this year. So pretty well excited about that. And now I'm having that like, well, what's next? 10 million, right? We just talked <laughs> about that. <laughs> I need to be happy and celebrate this. But I guess at the same time, I'm not trying to just retire and sit on the beach. Like I'm going to keep doing this and keep growing it. So um, the podcast, Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast or Instagram, Chris Bello underscore. And of course, chrisbello.com. So thank you so much for having me on the show and for allowing me to share my message here today. I really had fun.
absolute pleasure having you. And so, guys, wherever you're watching, uh, listening to this, please just like check the show notes. We'll have links to all Chris's profiles there. And if you know someone who, you know, maybe they could take a, a few of these little tips and tricks that Chris has shared about not only about focus, but about being really intentional with what you do for your business, with how you do your business and how you manage your time, please share this episode with them as well. And Chris, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kim. Likewise. Cheers.